You're listening to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast, a place for sex addicts to share their experiences of recovery, to help break the stigma, myths, and misconceptions of sex addiction. This podcast may contain topics of sexuality, sexual trauma, dysfunction, or other things that may be triggering. So listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. My name is Jason, I'm a sex addict, and I will be your podcast host for today. How's it going everyone? Welcome to episode number 94 of the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. This week I'm excited to be sharing part two of the Bay Area SAA and COSA speaker meeting from earlier this May. This episode will be featuring David Kay from San Francisco, and he has been part of SAA for over 20 years. I've known David for many years, whether it was from visiting meetings up in San Francisco or at the Bay Area SAA retreat, and especially at the talent show. And I'll be getting to that at the end of this episode. So this recording has taken me a while to finish. It's been another extremely busy week. In addition to searching for and buying a car and the other hassles wrapped up in that, I've had a few other anxiety-driven issues to deal with, but I've also had a chance for a little bit of fun. Midweek, when I'm usually editing this podcast, I went to see Mr. Bungle, which is one of my favorite bands. I got to see them live up in Oakland. I also had a chance to take my son to see a thrash metal show on Sunday. It's a lot of outer circle activities going on, a lot of fun. So anyway, I'm finally back to working on the podcast now. Just a note, I will probably be taking the next few weeks off due to my son's school finishing up, and just a lot of other things that have been keeping me busy. So now back to David. In this recording, he talked a lot about prayer, and I wanted to select a reading from Voices of Recovery from May 31st, which is today as I'm recording. And this is found on page 152. And it starts, When this happens, I stop, take a deep breath, and think, Oh yeah, that's right, it's not about me. In this way, I can start my day over any time I want to. Sex Addicts Anonymous, page 326. Before I even got on my knees this morning, I realized I had already been off to the races, off and running on the old racetrack of my mind. In the time it took to fix some coffee, let the dog out, and start my prayer, I had used the three-second rule twice, rehearsed the events of yesterday, and started obsessing. I was already self-focused, my problems, my ego, my way. Gently, I heard God calling me back to the starting line. Okay, a false start. Let's try again. I prayed, help me fix my eyes on you. Help me run this race called life according to your will and not mine. Put the things that matter uppermost on my mind and heart. Let love be my fuel today. I became open to making new choices in the light of my higher powers transforming love and care, a way of gentleness and compassion. I then asked how to do that today. The message was simply to be more present with the person I was with. I read a familiar passage on love which reminded me of the fourth step inventory. Although I wasn't there yet, I knew that my higher power was already beginning to lead me on this new, off-track race, a long-distance endurance run, not a sprint, something far better than anything I could imagine. By grace, I could run it today. I drank in the love for fuel, and I was off and running. In the meditation at the end, God, in the race set before me today, show me how to run it your way. The way of love. Yeah, prayer has definitely helped me out when I'm feeling off kilter. One of the other things that I really liked about this reading was the theme of running, which was the focus of David Kay's performance at the Retreat Talent Show, and I'll be sharing that at the end of this episode. 
few things before getting to the recording. The sound on Zoom did go out a few times during the recording, and I tried to clean up the audio, but just a heads up, there are a few patches there where it was a bit rough. Also, my good friend Shelly had the honor of introducing David at the SAA COSA speaker meeting, but that was not recorded, and I wanted to mention that since David makes reference to that here at the beginning of the recording. So, now without further ado, here is David Kay. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, thank you so much, Shelley. And I have to say that I deny every nice thing that Shelley just said about me, in addition to having to follow. <laughs> but I'll do my best on all of those accounts. It's uh, an honor to be here tonight. And um, you may possibly surmise, uh, given what I'm wearing, that I might be in Hawaii, uh, which I am. And uh, It actually, in a way, ties in in an uh, interesting way because there's so much beauty here, as I'm sure anyone who's been to Hawaii knows, the creation of God. You can see it almost every moment. And yet, at the same time, it's a a challenge for a sex addict to be in this atmosphere where all the young women are wearing, you know, very little to dress. It's, It's interesting. But let's get to where I came from. And my inner circle has been pornography, phone sex with both men and women, adult bookstores, occasional prostitutes, seeing prostitutes, chat rooms. And at this moment, I have 22 years and two months, or what I would rather refer to as 8,119 one days at a time. I really believe that that's what's important. I've always heard that the most important, the only step that you need to work perfectly is the very first step. And I cannot at any point decide in my mind, I've, uh, I have been able to uh, once again, resuming thinking that I have any power over this. So what it was like for me 30 years before I came in, probably similar to almost all the sex addicts in the program, that sex sex was on my brain almost every moment. Uh, I couldn't be present because I was always thinking about and wanting, uh, looking forward to the next sexual hit. So when I was at home at, in the morning, I would be waiting in, at my computer until I, I heard the garage door go up as a sign that my wife was leaving and I can turn on my theater and uh, start acting out. And then when I heard the garage door come back down again later, uh, I was busy trying to erase all the places I had been to. And that continued on at night. Uh, You know, so when it started to get late at night, I would kind of like sneak upstairs, check if my wife was asleep. And if she was, then the theater uh, reopened at work. It was something similar at lunchtime. I would trot down to the adult bookstores. It was very interesting because I would go into these places with my head down because I didn't want to know if somebody outside who knew me saw me going in. I didn't want to confront anybody inside who might know me when I went in. So it was all head down until I got into the booth and I couldn't lift my head back up until I'd gotten back to work, or if I wasn't working, I'd driven there, I'd gotten back into the car and and left the whole place. The thing that was interesting uh, about this for for me is that uh, I I guess I'm not completely sure what a disassociation mean, but basically, in my mind, I, I was never doing anything wrong because, in my mind, it was like a dream. And if I went to bed at night and I had a dream about crashing my car, well, you know, why would I call Allstate in the morning? Because it actually never happened. And um, the l- low point for me, I guess, was I met my daughter in 2001 in Nepal. She had traveled through India and we met in Nepal and we went on a trek together. But before we did that, 
I can remember leaving the hotel room we were in and going out and uh, having, you know, sex with a prostitute in a massage parlor and then coming back and lying to my daughter about where I had been. And that was like the low point. But I did not have any physical, I'm going to get maybe to the roots of it now, because I did not have any physical, emotional, or sexual abuse as a child. But what I did find out at a certain point in my life through a a body therapy, that my mom did not pick me up as a baby. I regressed to being an infant on the on the bed in the therapy and hitting the bed and screaming and for my mother to come pick me up and it never happened and it went on over and over so consequently I think subconsciously I knew that if my mother quote couldn't love me how could anybody love me and consequently uh, the first wife that I married was an equal you know i didn't know it at the time but she was bipolar she would get extremely depressed and there were times i would be on the job at work and you know i had a job that required you know my attention very much but in my mind i i didn't know whether she or my kids would be alive when i got home And I believe that, you know, this in essence was the root of my, the start of my addiction at that time. So uh, finally, I divorced her after 13 years. And two years later, I married a beautiful, (laughs) wonderful woman. We've now been married 39 years. (laughs) She uh, has a lot of character defects, which is good since I do also. So we were matched. I think on a subconscious level, I really rec- immediately recognized when I met her that she had a, a wonderful soul. And she's gone on to become an ordained interfaith minister, is now doing chaplain work. But when we got married, <laughs> she had three sons. I had two daughters. They were age 7 to 17, and they all lived with us. <laughs> And people called us the Brady Bunch. No, we were the survivors. (laughs) We had no idea what we were getting into. It ended up, um, you know, chaos. We had five unhappy kids. They all had lost their parents one way or other, and they were not happy. And I thought, you know, my stepsons would call me dad. I didn't know it would be a-hole dad. Uh, One of them pulled a kitchen knife on me. One of them pulled a golf club on me. One of them sexually assaulted my daughter. And that has never been resolved, which is so sad. But that at this point is in God's hands. And, um, you know, just to, for my own health, uh, I had a body bag in the basement that I'd go down and smack when things got out of hand. But basically, it was my addiction that, you know, in a way kept me alive. I had some comfort, but it didn't do any good that I wasn't controlling it. So at a certain point, my wife walked in on the computer with me not having clothes on and wanting to know what I was going to do about it. So that changed the, the landscape of my life. I had to make a decision about what to do. So I decided I'd go to an SAA meeting. And I very much remember the first one I went to was at the old Jewish Community Center in San Francisco on a Tuesday night. And I remember walking in there and uh, I was scared and I thought I'm going to be walking into a room full of perverts. And then I realized I was one of them. And it was very interesting because people were going around in the room you know, I have five years sobriety. I got two years sobriety. Well, I couldn't get, I couldn't even conceive that anybody, if they were doing what I was doing, could have five days sobriety. And that was for, to me, was like as far away as Alpha Centauri. But, you know, I started going back and and slowly um, changed things. 
I got a therapist too. And he asked me, you know, who you're doing this for? I'm, you know, am I doing this to save my marriage? And I thought about that. I thought, you know, I'm almost 60 years old now. Do I really want to be doing this? There was part of me that felt like I was still an adolescent. And, you know, it was that point where I realized the shame. So uh, I started working the program, the steps of the program. It's really interesting. My wife is in a different fellowship and I'm in SAA. But every morning we are gone. She's in she's in OA. I'm in SAA. But every morning here in Hawaii, we are going to the uh, 12 coconut meeting, which is outdoor at the beach at 7 a.m. And uh, it's all the same. It's 12 steps. We go to Hawaii. Uh, it's like you barely find uh, an SAA meeting in Hawaii. It's like no one in Hawaii sucks at it because you can find, you know, a million AA meetings. But whatever. It helps us keep our sobriety going. Just we we do it almost every day here. And the steps, you know, I've worked the steps. And to me, you know, it ha that has to be done. But by and large, for me, the soul of the program is my relationship with a higher power. Now, I feel real fortunate because I've seen so many people come into this program and they've had to struggle with that because they just can't conceive of a higher power or they've had a higher power in their life that, you know, booted them out if they didn't follow all the rules. Both of my parents were Jewish, but they uh, were not practicing. So essentially, I grew up with nothing. I wouldn't say exactly nothing because both of them met uh, in a hiking club. Contra Costa Hills Hiking Club. That was the internet dating of the day back in the 1940s. And we went off hiking forever. I think my father found his relationship with a higher power just in the beauty of the world. I know that I that's certainly, you know, a major part of my higher power. I can see that in the beauty of everything that I see here in Hawaii today. I even for the first time saw a, in an aquarium I didn't know even exist a sea dragon. I've seen seahorses, but not a sea dragon. And that just blew me away. So for me, I didn't feel like I had a roadblock. In fact, I actually envied people uh, before I came into program that I saw had a faith in a higher power that actually worked for them. So it wasn't so hard for me to jump in on this when I got in. But I think the greatest share I've ever heard in this program around that issue was a guy who very succinctly said that he spells God with two O's. And that in a way kind of shocked me because it really, for me, lowered the bar. Um, I didn't have to turn water into wine to do a godly act. All I had to do was any act that's good. You, everybody here being here, every me speaking tonight, uh, greeting a newcomer, um, you know, doing a reading, it's all an act of God, it's all good. And in the time where I've had this relationship with a higher power, I've tried to bring some actual physicality in to it because in essence, it's a placebo because none of us can actually prove that it's there. But, you know, to help me make it more workable, like if something good happens, that I've done or that essentially God has allowed me to do, I will point up, you know, like Stephen Curry does to no, it's not me who did it. You did it. You know, when I do some weights now and then I, you know, I do curls like this with them, I will actually picture my higher powers hand behind it, pushing it up with me. And honest to God, it seems to be easier than if I'm doing it myself and, and actually I've kind of evolved to where sometimes I have a woman's hand there doing it also, because I thought, well, you know, God is both. So why am I just doing it with a guy? So I, I've had a spiritual experience. I feel like um, I've had a number of spiritual experiences. If I say that, I, I don't want to think like I'm a prophet. It's happened maybe five or six times over 20 years and maybe nothing in the last five. But the most important one, came um my brother lives in australia and i met him there in 2003 
So I was like maybe two years into the program in recovery. And we hiked up the Langtang Valley together. And uh, on the last day of the trip, well, I was going up above each of the Buddhist uh, villages along Langtang Valley. There are prayer flags and money rock walls uh, above the villages. So I was going up already there and doing prayers. And on the last day, I went up. I got up maybe around 6 a.m. before the sun had come up, and I went up to the top of the hill. I sat there in this enormous beauty, and um, I started to mumble my prayers. And, and I, you know how it is. Sometimes you just say the same things over and over, and it's almost like a cliche. <laughs> but at that point, I heard a voice. I felt I heard a voice that said, stop. This is my power. So I looked up the valley. And at that moment, the sun came over the Tibetan hills and hit the white 25,000 foot peaks in the valley and turned them solid gold. I sat there in peace, real peace. And that real peace honestly has not reappeared in 20 years uh, to that extent for sure. And then the voice said, my will be done. And all I could say is that it shook me to the core. I thought about it all the way down. And even today in my prayer room at home, I have a 20 by 30 inch picture of exactly where I sat on that day. So it reminds me uh, when I do my morning practice. And I think I can talk about the few other times I've kind of heard that voice over the years. Well, I did hear a voice in the first month of my, when I got into the program, I hadn't had any sobriety. I was at uh, up late at night at three in the morning and I was triggered by uh, my favorite fantasy and I was getting scared, you know, what's happening. And so I decided I'll make this deal with God. So I said to God, if I'm willing to give up this fantasy, will you not make me a sex addict? And the response that I got was in essence, no, you will always be a sex addict. I made you this way, so you will be tied to me forever. And that also really hit me in the sense that whatever this voice is, it's saying it's good for me to be a sex addict because there's so much that I can be better, you know, by not being a sex addict. So also I can remember one time um, I was at a stoplight and there was a real young, attractive woman that was walking by in front of me and I started to get really triggered. And I said, I said, OK, you know, God, please help me with this. And that voice that seemed to say, if you want my help, ask before you start to look. Don't ask me to bail you out. And. Wow. Yes. And that's what, you know, <laughs> that's what I end up in a certain way. Uh, saying to sponsees nowadays, you know, when something's going on, you know, I say, try to fight the battle between the outer and middle circle. After 9-11, and that was essentially shortly after 2001, you know, I got really depressed. And I've never been depressed before that or since. In a certain way, I was, I welcomed it because it helped me understand my ex-wife better. But well, I think what it was all about was not 2001. I was fearful all the time. I was afraid anthrax, et cetera. That fear was with the depression. And I kept asking God over and over to relieve me of the depression. And finally, I thought I heard a voice that said, don't ask me to relieve you of the depression. Depression is part of life. Fear is part of life. Ask me to walk with you while you go through the fear. So that also was very positive. At one point, I felt really didn't like praying. I didn't want to pray anymore. This is too much. I pray. And then I heard the voice say, if you don't pray, how will you know you're not alone? And I don't think I'm alone. I think now, you know, through this program, I have a higher power. When things happen, I have somebody with me that I can go to. You know, I used to think when I came in that, you know, that it was that it was my addiction that was my problem, like 
you know, almost like so many other people, then we all seem to find out that it's not our addiction. It's our uh, defects of character that were the, always the problem. And now, you know, I could have an opportunity to work on those defects of character. I still have all, all my character defects. I kind of, when I go through the steps, I will, um, next time I will kind of, first time I put it, well, what percentage is this bad, you know, dominate my life? And then I try to check it the next time, see where it's went. A lot of the character defects for me have, have gotten, you know, greatly reduced. My fear around uh, money is like always been my highest. And, um, it's gotten better, but you know, you get it from where you came. My father went through the depression and he laid it down so heavy on me because he was afraid that the, you know, another depression was going to happen any day. And that's a character defect that I still have to work on, you know, more and more. It doesn't drop that much, but it, slowly I'm able to work on it. I haven't worked the full steps in quite a while. So there's part of me that thinks I'm a monster fraud. Uh, in this program, but I kind of justify it to myself because I do probably, you know, an hour spiritual program every morning where I go do a inventory on my gratitudes, my resentments, harms, amendments to I came across the previous day, fears, and inevitably <laughs> over my character defects about that comes up, the uh, fear of economic insecurity comes up. I also uh, put up every day uh, in the morning, I, I list the things I'm going to do every morning. So the following day, I can, you know, do a, my list around it. And the first thing I always do every day is sexual. And I put up BW, that means beware. And it means today, when I am out in the world, if I'm on Fillmore Street or on a BART car, you know, where, where am I going to be challenged on this day as it comes up? My, you know, if I'm going to a warrior game, you know, oh, by the way, I have a great resentment at this moment because I had to skip today's warrior game. But however, <laughs> more important for sure. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, that would be another place where I would be challenged. And I'm challenged here, of course. So that's there. And then the following day, I put actually, you know, underneath that, I put MC middle circle, and then I'll write down you know, where did I have a middle circle the previous day? So, uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, okay, so I am still an addict. It's the never-ending story. It's like they say that the person that has the longest sobriety in our program is the person who woke up the earliest that day. Because all I have is, is today, and that's a new day to react to. I like that I have a long-term chip in front of my candle in my prayer room, but I also have a one-day chip there too to remind me of how quickly it could just revert back to the beginning. I, ha I was really tested a year and a half ago. My wife uh, was diagnosed with the ovarian cancer. She went through six treatments. She had to be hospitalized seven times. Um, I was doing a lot of Looking at images, I could have clearly lost my sobriety then, if, blessing that that didn't happen. We don't know what the future is. It reminds us that our relationship is also now one day at a time, as it would be any time. Because I remember when that therapist had asked me way back when I started, you know, who are you doing this for? I had to do it for myself. I realized that my wife could die in a car tomorrow. Do I really want to do this? keep doing it. And I don't, I didn't then, uh, I don't now, I have a lot of work still to do. You know, Shelly talked about uh, several of the things that I've been involved with in my life in a wonderful, blessed, creative way that I've gotten so much joy from. But I am jealous of my brother in Australia who has six grandchildren and a great, huge part of his life is with them. And that's something I want to start in my life now, become more closer to my grandchildren. And I took uh, one of them to the Warriors uh, Sacramento playoff game a couple of weeks ago. And I think I'm finally on the road. Somebody had given me a, this is it, I'm wrapping up. Somebody had given me 
a, a, a T-shirt that on it said, number one, grandpa. That T-shirt has been in my drawer for 10 years because I would have been ashamed to wear it. And I wore it after I took him to that game. And I wanted to be able to feel pride and wear it again more often. And that's through recovery, progress, not perfection. So thank you all very much. My time is run out. Thank you. Many thanks to David. I really loved hearing that and would love to see the picture that he talked about from Tibet. Such a beautiful thing. I have a very large photo of El Capitan that I took when I was at Yosemite. And that reminds me of the beauty of nature and connecting me to my higher power. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, David did perform at the talent show this year. And so I got a recording of that and he has done a number of one man shows. And this is a five minute segment from his newest performance called he wants to run. And he did perform this without the microphone. And so I tried to do my best to clean up the audio. We could hear him perfectly well in the room, but for the recording, the mics were far away. So I did my best. Oh, and there is a little bit of uh, poop humor in there. Uh, but yeah, here's that. David K is up next. So I am David K. And this is a five minute excerpt from a new 55 minute solo theater work I've been doing called He Wants to Run. It's about a guy who hates running and dogs. <laughs> and how I ended up running with my neighbor's dog in Cloverdale for 13 years and what Butler taught me about living and dying. Uh, in 2001, my wife Sandra and I purchased a vacation home in Cloverdale. It was at the end of a dirt road flanked by colorless homes, cars with broken windows, and yards filled with years of junk. The upside was the property had a nice house, had a one-minute unimpeded walk to a beautiful beach on the Russian River. However, every time I went to go running, the neighbor's stupid dog would jump out, run across the street, grab me, and start pulling me up the road. And as I said, I just don't like dogs that much. <laughs> but the owner finally agreed, we talked, that every time he saw me head out to run, he'd just throw the dog into the backyard. I told him, don't worry, we're not up here every week, and even when we are, I don't run every day. So two weeks later, we've come back up to Cloverdale, and late in the afternoon, I go out to run, and my entire carport is filled with dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> and the damn dog is here. Well, that's my neighbor's. Will, you said that you would keep your dog in the house, and now he is shit over my entire carport. Well, um... Actually, uh, Dave, uh, uh, this uh, poop here is uh, not a uh, butler's uh, poop. Now, a uh, butler's poop is very long, it's very hard, <laughs> it's, solid, it's black in color, solid in consistency. Now, as you can see here, this poop is very small, it's curly, it's very light in color, it's soft in consistency, and yes, indeed, it smells like the worst poop ever to come out of a dog's butt. <laughs> well, do you know whose dog's poop this is? Yeah, actually, I believe this poop is uh, is uh, our other dog, uh, York Waba's poop. <laughs> uh, she's part Yorkshire Terrier, part Chihuahua, York Waba for short. Now, I know, <laughs> now, I know it cannot be our uh, other dog, our third dog, the German Shepherd Doris poop. Because uh, right now, she's just uh, pooping diarrhea. She's new. We haven't figured it out. <laughs> oh, yeah. The neighbors have told me about that dog. Yeah, I just wish they'd stop calling her uh, Diarrhea Dora. <laughs> now, let me tell you what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to come out here. I'm going to, I'm going to put Butler in the backyard. I'm going to come out here. I'm going to clean up all this poop. And once again, I'm very, very sorry. So I hear the neighbor's back door slam shut. The dog is barking and he's whimpering. So I head up the dusty road of Elsie Way and, uh, huh, speaking of shit, somebody has abandoned an old refrigerator right in the middle of the road. Maybe it wasn't such a great idea to buy the prop. Oh no, and the dog is here again. Butler, no, Butler, Ben, Dave. Butler jumped the fence. He's never jumped the fence before. I'll take him back and I'll tie him to a tree. Uh, yes. Well, that would probably be a good idea. I'd just like to have, you know, one peaceful little run. But I'm looking at the dog and he has this expression on his face that reminds me of the dog bunny that I brought home from the supermarket when I was seven and dad gave him away a week later. Uh, you know something, Will? Uh, I give up. Just let him run with me. And so he turned the corner on the McRae Road and he's a hundred feet ahead of me and he's a hundred feet behind and now he's a hundred ahead. And I think back to the time I was 15 years old and I contemplated how old I'd have to be when the new millennium came. <laughs> 57 years old. At that time, I thought that was an impossible age to reach. But uh, now the new millennium is here. And I am here. And the hills are rolling and green. Where are you taking me, doggy? And he leads me through this narrow forest trail. And we come to this opening. And before us stand two wise old oak trees. Their arms are outstretched to greet us in the late day. <clears throat> Golden pot of dew. The gray green moss hanging from their limbs like delicate lace scarves. Thank you, doggy. Thank you. Hey, honey. Uh, Sandra, I ran with that dog again. You did? His name is Butler. He likes to run. I think I like him. <laughs> so grateful to hear that. And uh, yeah, he's done some other comedy and a couple of other one-man shows, including one on sex addiction. And I am absolutely in awe of the work that he's done. But due to anonymity, I'm going to keep my statements brief there, but so grateful for his work and what he's done. Uh, thank you so much, David. Before closing out this episode, I did want to get to a few emails. And this one I just loved. And of course, I will be abbreviating these to keep the writer's name anonymous. Dear Jason, I just happened to listen to episode number three, the first one I ever heard. First approach to SAA, it was a great resource. The recording, with a few differences, was a close description of my life on that area. For anonymity reasons, I wouldn't post a public feedback on YouTube, but just wanted to let you know I really appreciate the courage and work to put this podcast together. I can't find an SAA group in my area in Singapore, but this podcast is wonderful. Many thanks. A. Hey. Yeah, I am so grateful that people around the world are able to listen to the podcast here when they don't have any meetings in their immediate area. And I will we'll be sending him a link to some other meetings that are in roughly the same time zone on Zoom that may be a possibility. The next one I wanted to read just came in yesterday and says, Hello, Jason and Associates. 
I'm Jeff from Pennsylvania, and I am a sex addict. I first walked into an SAA room rather fortuitously in the fall of 2018. In February 2017, I had been arrested for inappropriate online activity with a minor. The wheels of justice oftentimes turn slow, but I had the blessing of remaining free during my process. During this time, I started treatment in a sex offender program and had become an active member at a local church. During fellowship time following worship service on September 2nd, 2018, I candidly shared about my sexual offense and impending sentencing with a fellow member of a men's breakfast group that I frequented at the time. As it turned out, this individual was a member of SAA and invited me to a meeting that very night. The rest, as they say, is history. I wish I could say that my entry into the SAA program was the start of my sexual sobriety. Like many of us, however, my journey has been an indirect one. Sometimes it has been smooth sailing, other times a rocky path. I've enjoyed weeks and perhaps even months of abstinence at times, but I have continued to have slips and relapses along the way. Over the last year, I have absolutely been in a rut. I have continued to serve in a service role at my home group, leading meetings, maintaining our funds, etc. Over the past nine plus months, though, I have attempted to white knuckle my sobriety and have failed. I've failed because I've not been living the 12 steps. I don't currently have a sponsor. I've been hanging out in the middle circle and taking detours into the inner circle. Recently, a new member in my home group mentioned your podcast, which I was completely unaware of. I listened to one of the most recent episodes and enjoyed it, so I started back at episode one. Every episode has provided valuable insight. I particularly found episode four, The Three Circles, to be a fantastic resource. I'm writing this email specifically to comment on episode seven, however. Torin described my recent struggles to a T at the 105 mark on the podcast when he talked about the insidious nature of how we addicts experience denial. Over the past year, I have compartmentalized, rationalized, and minimized just as he describes. I have pretended to seek sobriety while still trying to keep one foot in my addiction, specifically fantasizing about and acting out with male friends while attempting to be a faithful husband to my wife. I've bargained and justified, saying, well, I'll just hook up with this one friend and we'll keep it our secret. I've pretended that I need this outlet as a bisexual male to be a whole person. I've minimized the effect that I know it will have on my wife when she finds out what I've been doing. I've also been ignorant of the effect it has had on my own dignity and emotional well-being. I am pleased to report that I have had an awakening a week ago and came to my senses. I credit your podcast with playing a large role in that. A week ago today, I found the courage to make a change and have now recommitted to recovery. I came clean at my home group meeting. I have made the program a part of my daily routine instead of only thinking about SAA two days a week when I attended meetings. I'm going to start attending more meetings online. I'm actively seeking out a new sponsor to start over at step one. I'm excited about reclaiming my dignity and integrity. Thank you so much for your service, and I look forward to connecting at some point in the future. Sincerely, Jeff from Pennsylvania. Thank you so much. I am, you know, like I mentioned with a previous email, you know, I'm just so touched to hear from people whose lives have really been affected by this podcast and uh, just blown away by that. And you're very welcome. And I look forward to connecting with you as well. And that'll about do it for this episode. So if you did want to leave feedback for the podcast, you can reach us at feedback at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. Or if you wanted to get a hold of me to ask me any questions about the podcast or the SAA program, be a guest on the podcast or part of a panel, you can reach me at jason at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. And with that, I'm going to close this one out. I thank you for tuning in. And as always, keep coming back. 
The views and opinions contained in the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bay Area Intergroup or the ISO of SAA. 